the new CBR1000RR, Honda has sharpened up the fire blade once again. Here it is now and I have tried out everything it is capable of. Stay tuned, I'll tell you all the details in a moment. Swift Yard 218 horsepower, um, 113 Newton meter and 201 uh, kilograms. Uh, these are the rough key data of the new fire blade, which have not changed much. Visually too, you could say that a lot has remained the same, but if you take a look under the shell, there really are a lot of new features. And let's take a look at what those are now. Perhaps it's best to start with the heart of the vehicle, the engine. Barely a single part has been left unchanged. A lot of new materials or different materials have been used. Many parts have been optimized and made lighter. The crankshaft, for example, has, a, has lost almost half a kilogram, so it's 450 grams lighter. The connecting rod, for example, has been made 20 grams lighter. Valves have been made lighter. Um, not much, uh, just one gram, but still everything that has oscillating parts and moving parts, you notice every gram of weight that's lost. Um, a quarter of a kilogram has even been saved in the housing, which of course also helps to reduce the overall weight, even if it is not a rotating part. New pistons were also used. This has also increased the overall compression. Again, it is now 13.6, which of course also benefits greatly from increased power values in the mid-range and helps to make the entire power spectrum or the power curve uh, somewhat fuller in order to have more steam from the bottom end. The gearbox has also been improved. That, that is a very good value. The first generation of the vehicle, which had a very long gear ratio, has now taken a different path. Fortunately, because this long gear ratio was rather problematic and has been significantly shortened here. This was not only solved by the final drive ratio, by the number of gears, by the gears at the rear, but also by the uh, gear ratios themselves. The gearbox was also set up differently in each individual gear, reducing the spread somewhat, so to speak, in order to ensure a better connection from one gear to the next, to make the speed jump somewhat smaller. And that was definitely a step in the right direction. So here too, a massive effort has been made. Uh, another major change, which, which of course also involved a lot of uh, structural changes, was the throttle plate. A two-part throttle valve system was implemented here, which means that I have the option of using intermediate cylinders between cylinder two and intermediate cylinders three and four the two cylinder banks, as they say, to generate different throttle valve openings. And that helps in various areas. For example, when you start to apply the throttle, if you normally apply gas in standard systems, all four throttle valves open by the same amount, controlled, of course, via the ride by wire, which is basically tunable. However, only the entire throttle valve unit can open and close here the electronics can proceed separately here. This means that in the first step, only two throttle valve bodies on one side are open slightly at first, the others remain closed, and this helps to generate a particularly smooth load change. Of course, it, you can also hear it acoustically because only two cylinders start firing at the beginning, and it sounds a bit like a mistuned motorcycle because it gets a bit crumbly and produces a real creaking noise, but that in turn gives the rider feedback where he knows, okay, the vehicle is now starting to pick up power again. This enables a very nice transition and a very nice change from coasting mode back to load and acceleration mode. That's a very good point, which I'll go into in more detail later. Another important point in the modifications is the redesigned exhaust system. 
uh, a lot of effort has been put into this, a lot of brain power, not only to optimize performance, but also to reduce noise emissions. Many of you may remember the first version, which was open. By open, I mean that there is a flap in the exhaust system, but it starts to open in a certain operating state. And the old exhaust was simply extremely loud. We had it on our test bench, and it was almost louder than open aftermarket systems. And that's why Honda has made improvements here and provided more pleasant sound. The sound has remained very good. So there has been no compromise here. It has just been significantly reduced in the areas where a lot of noise was previously emitted. This not only makes it more tolerable on the road, of course, but there have also been difficulties on, on many racetracks due to the extreme noise restrictions. Um, and Honda has now come to terms with this to some extent, giving riders the opportunity to ride on racetracks. Even on racetracks where there are stricter noise limits, they can ride this thing without any problems. Let's move on to the next point, which is the electronics. A lot has happened here to the six axis gyro from Bosch is still used here. Um, the IMU, which is actually there to determine the driving status by checking what kind of lean angle we have. Does the front wheel lift off the ground? Does it stay on the ground? Does the rear wheel lift off when braking? What kind of cornering acceleration do I have? Lean angle, etc. This system then passes on all of this concentrated information to the entire vehicle. And each of the units can make its calculations from this. For example, the ECU for the engine can perform uh, traction control calculations. For example, the ABS can also provide information about the lean angle, especially when entering a bend, which is important information for cornering ABS. And of course, all the traction controls and driving aids need this information. Another new feature is the latest generation, um, or rather the third generation of Ulin's um, components. And they are now also using this data, but we may come back to that later when we go into more detail about the suspension. Basically, the display is more or less the same, uh, the same as we already knew it from the previous vehicle. A few setting options have been added here, particularly with regard to the suspension. More on this later. We have again added three pre-selected or pre-configured modes that can be called up even while driving and two user configurable modes. You can then put them together and mix and match them as you wish. And you can also do this with the suspension settings you want, both the driving aids and the suspension settings, which can then be selected quite easily while driving using the control switch on the lever. As already known from the predecessor, we also have five different power mode settings that can be called up as required, whereby maximum power can always be called up at levels one and two. The only difference is how the engine responds to the throttle. And this is of course where the split throttle valve system comes into play. Depending on how strong you want this system to be, how strong this differentiation should be, you can choose between the two modes yourself and then also make a selection. And here you have the option of being able to adjust from a very strongly split setting to an almost parallel setting of the opening angle. And this can then be um, individually adjusted again, depending on the driver's wishes. In terms of the driving aids themselves, we have the usual suspects on board, as we already knew um, from the predecessor. We have traction control, we have engine brake, we have wheelie control, and the ABS can also be adjusted in various modes. This means that we have everything from the completely safe setting, from the road setting to the track setting, where you only systematically supply the front wheel with ABS and no longer perform liftoff detection from the rear wheel in order to ensure maximum deceleration. You actually have all the options here and can then mix and match this in the different operating modes in addition, the new generation has, of course, also worked on the control qualities. This is actually what is always being optimized from model to model. These controls and algorithms, they are always being worked on and improved. And this naturally results in more and better controls. With better sensors, uh, as we also have here with the Bosch 6 uh, axis sensor, you can, of course, generate extremely good control qualities. and. Uh, with all the setting options in the display, you can also individualize this very well and adapt it to the driver's wishes. The next big thing that has changed is the chassis. When we talk about the chassis, we are primarily talking about the frame. The frame 
uh, nothing has really stayed the same. There have been really big changes and not just in terms of weight. The frame itself has become about one kilogram lighter. But what is almost more important is that the flexibility of the frame has changed massively. We have around 15% less torsion and bending stiffness, which has a massive effect on the handling. I may come back to this later when it comes to riding impressions but that's definitely a big change. The seating position with the standard add-on parts has changed massively again. The handlebar ends have been raised considerably more and brought closer to the seat. As a result, you are no longer quite so aggressive on the bike and have somewhat more relaxed options, which is not always a bad thing for the racetrack either. While the first generation of the new Fireblade was equipped with a very aggressive stance, it is now much more restrained and tame. And this helps massively on the road in particular, but also on the racetrack, because you are no longer sitting on the bike in such an extreme position. When we talk about the chassis, we might as well talk about the suspension again now. We have, at least in the SB version, the new electronic suspension from Erlins, and this is the latest generation, so a lot has happened there too. Uh, Erlins has done a lot of work there, especially in the valves that are uh, installed inside. Uh, they are now equipped in such a way that they more or less no longer have to absorb much force. In the past, when there was a large flow of oil, this valve also had to absorb a lot of force. This has now been made more or less force-free by using compensating bores, which enables faster adjustments under load, you can imagine that an engine no longer needs to work so hard against the pressure of the hydraulic fluid or the fork oil, for example, and has faster adjustment options. A lot has been done here. The algorithms themselves have also been massively revised uh, thanks to the six axis system installed here. You also have a lot of information and we are already starting to make the driving conditions not only dependent on the current situation, but also to be able to calculate them in advance. And that's particularly important with systems like this because although the adjustment is relatively quick, it still takes a certain amount of time. And here you are well advised to be able to uh, estimate in advance what will happen in the next few tenths of a second so that you can pre-adjust the vehicle or suspension uh, accordingly. And a lot of work has been done here. Uh, the automatic mode in particular has been significantly improved in this respect. This is where you get the full benefit. And here you also have the advantage that you really have a lot at your disposal with these systems. Basically, we have the 43 millimeter Erlins fork at the front of the SB version and the TTX shock absorber from Erlins at the rear with these electronic adjustment options. However, these electronic adjustment options only focus on the damping and do not include the spring preloads. That would be uh, an addition that would be quite costly to make because spring preload in particular uh, means having to install a lot of different actuators. Uh, the driver would have to uh, do this himself. However, a nice gimmick has been built into the electronics because in addition to the adjustment option via the display, you can also enter the rider's weight. And this not only adjusts the damping in the background, but also gives the rider a recommended setting for the spring preload, which must then be carried out manually but is still a great help for all those who are not so intensively involved with suspension issues. And this is also a major change compared to the last model. Another point of change for Honda was aerodynamics, always more important in the past. You know it well from the MotoGP broadcasts. There is a lot of fiddling around here. There is also a lot of potential here. Honda had already installed the winglets at the front on the previous model. However, these have now been improved and modified again. They have tried to maintain or increase the downforce, the force that pushes the vehicle downwards without increasing drag. And they have managed to do this by constructing the wings in a different way at the front without making them too overhanging. I have to say, I personally like that very much. I'm not a fan of extremely overhanging winglets. That has been beautifully integrated here. In addition to the winglets, however, they have ensured that the entire airflow is better directed towards the vehicle and that the turbulence is reduced somewhat right up to the rear tire. The driver has also 
uh, been involved. The windshield has been adjusted again slightly on the incline to give the driver better wind protection and to create better aerodynamics. Yes, then we come to the most important point, how the whole thing can be ridden. We didn't have much time today. We only had two turns available. Uh, I wasn't able to really get to grips with the bike and try out different things, but I think it gives a pretty good idea of how the thing has changed. Firstly, the seating position, uh, I have to say, as I haven't necessarily grown very much, has changed very positively for me because you no longer sit on it quite so um, radically. Uh, we've usually made the seating position more relaxed in our conversions for precisely this reason. Honda has now gone in exactly the same direction and made the whole thing a bit more comfortable. And I have to say, that's also good on the racetrack. That's very positive, of course, because you don't need so much power here and don't have to sit so tightly on top of the bike to get the thing positioned properly. The engine itself, as we heard at the beginning, has really undergone a lot of changes. Um, these have also been quite noticeable. It's not that the peak power has increased massively. You also have to bear in mind that the higher standard, now already Euro 5 Plus, is still being complied with here and we have managed to comply with this without having to accept any loss of performance. On the opposite, these modifications have not increased peak power, but they have significantly improved performance in the mid-range and simply increased the pressure from the bottom right up to the top range. And that turned out to be really very useful. The other gear ratios in the transmission also play their part because, as mentioned at the beginning, this spread is somewhat smaller. Uh, it's easier to find the right gear out of every bend. And of course, you benefit from this, especially if you want to be a bit more gear happy on the road because you always have the necessary power available to bring together acceleration zones in a sensible way. What I really liked was the new suspension setup from Erlins, especially in automatic mode. So you can tell that a lot of work has been done here. While the previous automatic settings had a few problems, especially on the racetrack, where you were sometimes better off with manual adjustment systems, you can almost say that this is the first time you're at least at the same level, if not with the same small advantages. Very well positioned here in automatic mode. And you've already noticed that it no longer necessarily reacts to changes, but starts to make adjustments in advance. Uh, a logic reminder has more or less already been implemented, which helps the system to act in advance. And this is particularly helpful in different load conditions, such as on the brakes or when accelerating, uh, which of course requires different settings in the chassis. And the vehicle registers this in advance and is able to steer in advance. And I have to say that this has really brought benefits when driving. Um, I haven't yet been able to get to grips with the manual mode to the extent that I've been able to try out a lot here, but I have to say that I really like the automatic mode right away. We will report a lot more about it. We will then take a closer look at such a vehicle again in the near future and always bring it along to our race days and report on it here. But I have to say that for a first rollout, it worked well and I really liked it. For me, the biggest highlight of the vehicle is probably the modified frame construction. Not just because of the weight, but really because of the flex that has been changed here. We are here in Portimao on the racetrack, which has very twisting corners and some acceleration zones with slight bumps. And here you can clearly notice that the frame has become a little softer in the bend it's much easier to accelerate over such zones without the bike starting to become unstable. In other words, you can or you take some of the work off the suspension because the chassis itself ensures that these unevennesses are balanced out somewhat in the torsion because you can imagine that when the vehicle is leaning, the suspension can no longer absorb everything when you drive over bumps, but has to go into partial torsion the entire chassis pump. And of course, it helps enormously if the frame and the swing arm are a little more compliant in order to be able to filter out the whole thing in advance. And that was really very noticeable. We also had a dry phase where we were able to put a little more pressure on the suspension, and that was very noticeable. That will also bring some advantages in terms of tire life. We'll see exactly when we carry out further tests here. Now let's switch over to Adam Child and listen to his impressions. Adam offers a perhaps different perspective that promises valuable insights. Now on the surface, 
this might look like a little tweak to the fire blade. But trust me, I've just ridden it. This is not a little tweak. When I was in the presentation, it was interesting listening to the engineers because they've saved a gram there and a gram there on the engine. And it's about the same and the power difference is a little bit and the torque difference is just a fraction different. But honestly, it doesn't feel it. It feels so different. It, it just goes, it's got the drive that the old bike didn't have. It feels so, so fast to the point where in the first session, I was just holding on and, and trying to stop the thing from wheeling. It is a phenomenal, phenomenally fast bike. This is so, so fast. And it also handles that power. So the, the braking, the stability, the uh, corner entry, the, the split throttles, how they're working, how they're letting you wind on the throttle going from uh, two to four, the, the engine brake strategies. When you're braking into a corner, you can feel the engine braking. It's creating more engine braking than, than it ever should. It is such an impressive bike and we're only scratching the surface. So for example, we tried the automatic suspension modes, which is the generation three all-in suspension. The generation three all-in suspension is new for the Fireblade and has not been seen in the market before. And I was flicking between the uh, automatic road and the track setting, which means that compression and rebound is, is, is active and compression and rebound is active on the rear. Then after one session, we changed that slightly, changed manually the preload because I'm a little bit heavier. So we went from 75 kilograms to 80 kilograms. And that's all done. It lets you do that from the dash. Quick turn of the preload, went back out and the bike changed again. And we've not gone into the manual modes. Now in the manual modes on the suspension, you can change compression and rebound electronically. And then the suspension stays, uh, compression and rebound stay static. So it's more like a race bike. We've not played with those modes yet. We've not done that. We've not played with the multiple quick shifter that has three different options. We've not played with the engine brake strategies and the different wheelie control. The wheelie control that I had it in, in three, to me was just perfect. It just held the wheelie, which crazily, when you come onto the straight in fifth gear, you need it to control a wheelie in fifth gear. At the end of the straight, it's really 299 and it's in fifth gear and it's still pulling. This is a phenomenal, weapon of a bike as i say in the end of the first session i was generally came in going that is frighteningly fast it is unbelievably fast it's to the point where no politician or anybody in government should ever ride this bike because they might realize what we're actually up to but we need to visit this bike again and hopefully at ps magazine we're going to do a big group test and get all the thousands together um, i've ridden all the thousands already and in my mind this has definitely got the power, it's definitely got the handle, it's definitely got the electronics and the rider rates. What's going to push it close? We rode the BMW uh, S1000 RR in Almeria. That's got amazing electronics, almost like a video game bike. But this has got more power, I believe. The Panigale uh, V4S and V4R, ridden them both. Um, it's, it's going to be so, so close. But first impressions. Here in Portimao, as I say, we've only done a couple of sessions. We need to do more. We need to revisit this bike. But it's been a while since I've ridden a 1,000cc bike and inline four and just gone, Jesus, that's fast. And it is. This is so fast. This is a super stock bike from last year with road legal parts. In fact, you could race this bike as it is. Just put the race bodywork on, while out the sump plug, and this is fast enough and capable for fast tracks, Spa, Nürburgring, Isle of Man, Northwest, call it what you want. This has got the capabilities, this has got the cojones, this is possibly the new king of the class. Thank you Adam for your feedback and experience with the Fireblade. Basically you have to say that Honda has done a lot right here and has further improved an already good package. They've been working very intensively on the vehicle recently and I have to say the, uh, there are some really nice things here where you can get some benefits. It will be exciting again when you remove all the restrictions that have been built into the production vehicle but which are necessary to achieve uh, road homologation and let the real beast come out again. We will then try a few things on the test bench. I'm sure some more information will follow but so far I have to say I really enjoyed it even if the weather here wasn't exactly typical for Spain or Portugal, but we managed it well. I hope I've been able to give you some information about what's new with the Fireblade. Um, if you liked it, please leave us a like. I hope to see you again soon at the next presentation. Until then, I wish you good luck, have fun, and maybe we'll see you again soon. 
on the new Honda. Bye-bye.